thanks for taking time out of your busy day, um, out of your virtual day to uh, join me for this particular presentation called Freedom Redefined. And um, before I get really into the content, I just want to kind of say something up front. There are going to be some terms and things that are really archaic that I may say or that you may see or that you may read that may have you asking questions and you might be like, mm, I don't know, that's questionable. But what you have to realize is that in our world, right, these are things that have lived on our product pretty much from the very beginning, right? This is, this is literally almost every document that you were going to see today, actually every one, with the exception of the pictures, was pulled off of Ancestry or pulled off of emerging businesses. And so um, as you may not come across these in your everyday work life, they're there. And I really, really um, want to implore every single person to just browse, to see what you can find after hearing what I share with you today, because that will help inform the choices and decisions and, and just your thought process around everything that has to do with what we're seeing in our world and how it's evolving. It will give you a new lens from which to look at those things. All right, so getting started here, and um, this is a quote from someone, Kevin Levin, who I love. If you don't follow him on Twitter, he literally is a high school teacher um, that has gained an amazing following on social media because he studies the Civil War. And he actually just came out with a book, I want to say it was last year, maybe late 2018, that was about battling the myth of the Confederate uh, veteran that was Black, right? And so one of the quotes that, that I he said recently that I absolutely love. He says, we constantly hear the refrain that Americans know nothing about their history. But what if the problem is more about what they have been taught and continue to be taught rather than being taught anything at all? Consider that for a second. It may not necessarily be that we're completely ignorant. It may just be the way in which the things were taught to us. And, right, we've got to remember, history is evolutionary, right? Like today, we're living in the quarantine, right? We are in COVID-19. We are in the throes. This is an everyday thing. But how we talk about COVID-19 in the next decade is going to shift. It's going to change. As new information comes to light, as people share their stories, as, as data is gathered, as you know, you, you get a better bird's eye view as time goes on. And so we have to look at history, in particular history around the Civil War and around the founding of our country from the same lens, right? We can, we can apply our thoughts now as to what we would have done or would not have done, but we don't really know what we would have done because we didn't live then, right? So keep this in mind, right? You may be someone who has decided that you are going to be on the front lines of telling Aunt Sally about how she should not use that word anymore. Or you may be the person that says, you know what, at Thanksgiving, if we can gather, I'm going to start this conversation. But you got to remember, everyone that's coming to that table with that turkey, or maybe with the tofurkey, depending on how you get down, we're not all coming to the same table with the same lived experiences, and not just from life, but what we've been taught. So keep that in mind as you hear what I share with you today. All right, so the first part of what we're going to talk about today is literally the backstory of Juneteenth, right? I'm sure you've seen all the advertisements. Um, I feel like my social media feed, this is the, this is the, <laughs> this is the Juneteenth-y <laughs> my, my news feed and my social media feed has been ever. Um, I feel like I'm in the championships. Um, some of you all, if you watch sports, if you're World Cup people, if you're NBA finals, if you're the Super Bowl, we're literally in that for African-American genealogy today. That is where we are today. Juneteenth is like, I can't even explain it. Um, if, you, if, you are, if you're old like me and you remember solid gold with Marilyn McCoo and you get to the championships, maybe something similar to um, American Idol you know, now, um, or some sort of competition show where you get to the finale and we have all of the ticker tape that comes down. And then I wonder like, who's going to clean all that up like afterwards. That's where we're at right now um, with genealogy, with African-American research and with, with Juneteenth. And there are some things I'm going to share with you today about Juneteenth that you probably don't know. So let's jump into it, right? What is a conversation about history without a timeline? 
you have to know when and where people were where they were, right? And so when you're talking about the Civil War, right, and that, that's what Juneteenth is addressing, it's addressing the freedom of the enslaved people, right, within the United States, okay? But you've got to go back and you've got to cover the history of the Civil War, okay? So the Civil War began officially in Fort Sumter in South Carolina on April 12, 1861. And you may be watching this thinking, that was a long time ago. Actually, no, it wasn't. Um, it was not that long ago, right? Uh, the Confederate forces decided to fire on people, and then that's when it all, you know, as we say in, in Southern Cal, was on like Donkey Kong, okay? Everything just began, it started, it, it just was a wrap, right? We have Alexander Stevens giving his speech saying, hey, we're going to secede. He clearly states in his speech that it's over slavery. This is something that people are consistently arguing all the time, right? He argued that his cornerstone speech, that's what it's called, the cornerstone, was that it was about slavery, right? So you move forward two years, right? What most people know as the, you know, the end of slavery, or that even I was taught this in, you know, in, in liberal Southern California, so to speak, I was taught that slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. That's what I was told. Uh, this is news to you today. That's actually not altogether true. See, what had happened was President Lincoln said, okay, you guys, look, we've been at this for two years. Let me go ahead and just, since you're still out of order, since you're still seceding, since you still are saying that you are a separate country, let me, since you're still operating out of order for what our union is supposed to be, I'm going to proclaim, the, I'm going to release all the enslaved people that are still within certain areas of the United States, right? And we, naturally, right? I even, I even read um, historical accounts from people who were enslaved that refer back to the Emancipation Proclamation. It, it's just, I think just the name itself is kind of like, I don't know, it just sounds better than the 15th Amendment, right? So, but here's the thing, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free everybody. Let me give you an example. Look at this map. Now, some of you watching would say, okay, Considering that our cases of coronavirus have gone up in recent weeks, this looks like the map of, of states that have reopened. No, this is actually the map of uh, the states that were under secession. So those that are in, that were seceded from the union are in red. Those that you see with the gold star, that's, that's intentional. They had areas that were excluded from the Emancipation Proclamation. There are, in fact, several parishes in Louisiana that were excluded, including New Orleans. You also had several counties and cities within Virginia that were excluded from the Emancipation Proclamation, right? So those areas with the stars, those are, those, those are the areas that have exemptions, but the rest of the state technically fell under the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Then the blue states were considered border states. So because they didn't secede from the union, they didn't fall under the Emancipation Proclamation either. Now, when we, you're like Delaware, really, like that's way up there, Eastern Seaboard, what do you mean? Oh no, slavery was legal in the state of Delaware. I kind of feel like Delaware is a little like Missouri, where Missouri has kind of eclipsed its, you know, um, uh, it's, it's history of slavery, but there were slaves in Missouri too. Most people don't think St. Louis slaves. Yes, there were. It was a slave state, right? And so that was all going back to things like, you know, like the Missouri Compromise. And so when you do a tally at the end of the day, over 800,000 enslaved people were not even covered under the Emancipation Proclamation due to exemptions that are specifically laid out. Now, why am I including Oklahoma? Well, if you are a student of history and geography, you know, around this time, Oklahoma didn't even exist. It was the Indian Territory, right? And so how, how can I include Oklahoma? Well, the five civilized tribes being the Choctaw, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole were all in Oklahoma, and they practiced chattel slavery. So you have to remember, at that point, they were their own country within the country. So you had the, the, the states that seceded in all in red, then you had that were operating as their own country, and then you had Oklahoma, which was the Indian territory that operated as its own country, and then you had the United States that encapsulated all of that. It's a lot, right? In 1860, there were over 4 million enslaved people living within the United States. 4 million. 
So to exclude or to exempt 800,000, it's a lot of people, right? So we move forward in time. We finally get to when the 13th Amendment passes, right? And that's when it passed Congress. It wasn't until we, we got to the end, until both sides actually passed it. Isn't that crazy? One branch of our elective officials passed it in January and the other did not pass it through until December. A whole 12 months elapsed in order for the 13th Amendment, which is what you know, uh, abolishes involuntary servitude, except in the case of a punishment for a crime. We have to remember that as well, okay? Slavery technically has not ended within the United States because it was shifted to our penal system or to our system of incarceration. If you read the 13th Amendment, it literally says involuntary servitude, right, should not exist in the United States, except in the case of punishment for a crime. If you are interested in this, there is an amazing book called The New Jim Crow that covers the fact that our system shifted. In fact, what you see is as, as people were you know, emancipated, right, as enslaved people are no longer considered, considered enslaved, a new system emerges where people still want that cheap labor or where they don't have to pay a lot of money for it. And so they create petty crime and other things to, in, in an essence, re-enslave people. Um, I always tell the story about when um, I went to go do on-site research in my family's um, ancestral location in Louisiana. And it was me, you know, California girl, right? And one of my cousins that lives in Minneapolis. And we all met, we met, go to the courthouse. And so she wants to use the, you know, we to use the bathroom and she comes back and she goes, Nika. I said, what? She goes, there's a prisoner and he's out. Who do I go tell? And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh no, no, there's, there's some guy, he's in a jumpsuit. He's just walking around. And I, I don't know if he's supposed to be there or like, I, it's just weird. And so I said, actually, it's okay. That's what they do here. The people who clean the courthouse are the prisoners. And they're clearly labeled because of where they're, what they're wearing, right? And so that system still exists to this day. You will see it if you go to various locations, especially across the South, right? They'll even have them farming. Um, in fact, you're, you'll even see like at Angola in Louisiana, they have a world renowned rodeo. People who will never see the light of day participate in a rodeo every single year. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Now, I have to also throw this caveat in. The states, of course, had to ratify the 13th Amendment, but we, of course, had to have one state that said, no, we're not going to do it until 2013. Can anyone in the chat room guess who did not ratify the 13th Amendment until 2013, as in the year 2013, as in seven years ago? Anybody want to guess? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Let's see. Hold on. Somebody. Okay. I see people saying stuff. Ha <laughs> ha! You guys are great. And Mitchell, go ahead, girl. You know exactly what it is. Mississippi, you are right. The state of Mississippi did not ratify the 13th Amendment until the year 2013. Do you know what happened? They said that they did, but the paperwork didn't go through the right channels within the state. Because someone brought this up about 1995, but nobody went back to see, oh, did we actually file it? And they determined that they did not in 2013. So. Yes. When people say, should we still be talking about slavery? Yes, because it really just officially got ratified seven years ago. That is ridiculous, but it's true. You can Google it. All right. So the other part of the discussion here is, right, we're talking about Juneteenth, we're talking about freedom, what that looked like. Freedom, when it comes to people of African descent or Black people or African Americans who are living within the United States, is a continuum. It's not this hard stop, right? Like people may think Juneteenth, yay, that's the day we're free. You have to consider that before the 13th Amendment and before slavery was, you know, was abolished within the United States, we had a number of things that happened, right? There were people who were fugitives. Why would there be a Fugitive Slave Act if people weren't trying to seek their freedom, right? So that probably is one of the earliest ways that you see people who are involved in the system of slavery as enslaved people try to actualize their rights as humans or as people. 
is through self-emancipation or through fugitives, becoming a fugitive, fleeing, right? You know, the, the, probably the clearest example that most people have of this is Harriet Tubman, right? You have to think of people like Frederick Douglass who said, Chuck the Deuce is like, I'm done, I'm gonna leave you know, whatever, if, if you, um, you know, were at Roots Tech, or if you saw when I presented at Roots Tech, I talked about how one of my ancestors and my family did the same thing, fled up to Canada, and then ended up going to Australia, right? So we've got to remember that this whole idea that if there were, it wasn't like there were a bunch of sitting ducks that just were like waiting, twiddling their fingers and saying, oh, I wish I was free. No, people took the bull by the horn, so to speak, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not dealing with this. This is not what I, I, I want to see for my life. And I want to take advantage of, of, of what my personhood should be affording me in this country. And so you've got to have conversations about fugitives or people who self-emancipated. We also have to remember there, was, there were legions of free people of color living in the United States when the Civil War took place. I, 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 that's a story that not enough people know and that they talk about, right? 10% of the population of people of African descent living within the United States at the time of the Civil War were free. That means that they did not have a slaveholder. In some small instances, they may have enslaved other people. Usually those were family members to make sure that they weren't sold off or sold down South or whatever, right? But we, they built entire communities, right? Um, one that comes to mind, I think of um, communities in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. You see them in New Orleans, you see them in Charleston. These communities would pop up because they would insulate themselves to make sure that number one, they had access to all the things they needed. But number two, if something happened, they could galvanize themselves. They could protect themselves, right? And, and, in, and a lot of times, they were havens for people who were fugitives as well, okay? We also have to remember before the 13th Amendment, there were contrabands. In fact, you're looking at a picture of a young man who was considered a contraband. Now, you're probably thinking about that term in terms of maybe prison, right? Contraband, something you're not supposed to have, right? It technically doesn't have like a really positive um, connotation when we think about it. But in the sense of the Civil War, the contrabands were enslaved people who potentially their slaveholders just left and said, okay, look, the Union troops, they're here. They are not going to come and take my cotton and pillage all of my stuff and take it for their use. And so I'm leaving. And so sometimes ensla enslavers would just leave and they'd leave the overseer in charge of their enslaved people. Sometimes it would only be a few, sometimes it would be hundreds. And so when enslaved people knew the Union troops were near where they were and they knew that they could liberate them, they would, themselves would leave. And they began, to they began to start these camps that were called contraband camps. Contraband camps exist all over the place. In fact, there is one literally down the highway about 10 minutes from my house that's where one existed. There was one where my family was in, um, in Northeast Louisiana and they would put the enslaved to work. They did, and the thing that sucks about that is that these people who were in the contraband camps, they couldn't apply for a Civil War pension, even though they did technically act in service to the United States, right? The, where my family was from, these contrabands, they, they actually dug a canal that where my family lives is on the Mississippi Delta, and they wanted to connect the Mississippi River to a lake that is where my family is. And it's not, it's not that far apart. So they dug a channel so that Ulysses S. Grant could hide his gunboats there in the Battle of Vicksburg. Now, they didn't even end up using it, and the hole stayed in the ground for years. It, they didn't fill the hole up until, like, I think the 50s. <laughs> it's so cockamamie. They didn't. But contrabands built that. And so when you go and you walk across the area that it is, it, there's a big sign there that tells you about that. So we've got to remember, even though they were enslaved, they did try to um, seek freedom in whatever way they possibly could. We also have to remember about the U.S. color troops, Right? Now, at the onset of the war, they did not enlist men of Black descent. And we also have to consider, too, here that women were part of the war effort as well. It wasn't just men, right? And so if you enlisted in U.S. colored troops, right, or you had service in the U.S. Navy, right, we know over 170,000 Black men enlisted or participated in the Civil War as, as a part of the U.S. colored troops, and that 25% of the U.S. Navy were Black. The Navy during the Civil War was integrated. I'm going to say that again, because that's 
probably sounds like it doesn't sound right. The US Navy during the Civil War was integrated. So think about how, well, wait a minute. We integrated the military during the Civil War, but then during World War I and all the other conflicts, we went back to segregation and then didn't reintegrate our military until after World War II? Why? It's a great question, right? You have to remember, boating and, 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 and ships at that time was super dangerous. So it makes, I mean, it sounds sad, but it makes sense why they would integrate it because, I mean, you, you look at things like insurance on enslaved people, which was an entire industry. And if you were enslaved and you worked on a boat, your slaveholder who owned, or whoever owned the policy had to pay an extra premium because you worked on a boat because they were prone to explosions. So that might be a reason why I can't say altogether, but you have to consider that as well. Upon enlistment, that man or that woman who participated in the war effort, they were free. So that was one other way to try to secure your freedom. All right, so to get to Texas, cause you're like, you haven't even talked about Texas. Doesn't Texas have to be with Juneteenth? There's a reason why I set this up. I don't do anything just cause, right? I wanna give you the whole picture. We're gonna talk about the Battle of Palmetto Ranch. And you're like, really, a Battle of Palmetto Ranch? Well, you know what, let's talk about this because this is part of Juneteenth. On May 13th, 1865, more than a month after the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, remember that picture? We've, I think we've all seen it where it's very stoic and Lee is like, dang it, I lost. And he's there, Lincoln's there, they stage it, it's over. More than a month after that, the folks in Texas said, we're not going down without a fight. You're like, wait a minute. The troops, the Confederate troops there had actually gotten word that Lee had surrendered. So they knew. It wasn't that they didn't know. Oh, no, no, no. They were still trying to, they were still trying to be holdouts, right? They still were holding out hope that they were going to be able to pull this off. And a month later, we saw the last land action in the Civil War, and it took place in the state of Texas. So when you talk about Juneteenth and you talk about we're going out, to and free, you know, to, to let enslaved people know that they are now free. You've got to talk about how the last land battle in the Civil War happened in the same state. This is why in some ways we've got to celebrate Texas because, well, why? It took place, Palmetto Ranch, it's near Brownsville, Texas. It's in, it's in um, sort of like Eastern Texas. It's actually along the Mexican border, which is where this took place. And 250 men from the U.S. Color Troop 67th Infantry were involved in this battle and they won the battle. So yet and still again, we've got to come back to this whole idea of agency and what that looks like and con continuing to pursue freedom, not just because someone read a circular order, but because you recognize your personhood, even though before the law, it does not necessarily look at you the same way. There was no way, in fact, when you read the reports from, from those who were in charge, right, of, of the troops in this Battle of Palmetto Ranch, that, that they would have been as successful if they did not have the U.S. colored troops. So here and yet again, right, there is no twiddling of the thumbs and sitting and waiting. This is an active participation in your freedom and a denial of your subjugation. Yes, I, and I, oh, I cannot wait till we get to the next part. Boy, 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 I haven't even shared. I think I might be halfway through, but this is good, right? We need to know this context, right? Because as we buy the t-shirts, as we share the memes, as we cook up, you know, click on the Google Doodle and watch it move. It's actually really cute today. We've got to know what's all behind this, all behind it. So you're looking at Gordon Granger, and I'm sure you guys have seen his words, you know, um, in the circular that was, you know, circulated, right? So you've got Battle of Palmetto Ranch. Short time later, okay, this is when he comes in to Galveston and issues the news of freedom. Now, something else you may not know about Texas, where right, you gotta remember, wasn't admitted to the union as early on as other states like Virginia, right? Or North or South Carolina. 
Texas was a huge hub of e the illegal slave trade, in particular Galveston. So I don't consider it any coincidence that the word got out late in Texas. There are a whole, there's a whole community. In fact, those of you who like to do searches or flights of fancy like I do from time to time, if you look at the 1870 census in Matagorda County, Texas, you will find several pages of people who were born after the importation of slaves in 1808, right? Where you could not bring in enslaved people from Africa after that time period. You will find them on the census living on the, on the Gulf Coast in Texas and they were born in Africa in 1820, 1830. How is that possible if the importation of slaves is banned? And not only were they born in Africa, but they have African names still. Hmm. So I don't think it's coincidental that word went out in this particular area of Texas when it was very well known to have illegal importations of Africans directly from Africa. Sometimes they would stop in the Caribbean, but they would come to Texas. In fact, our boy Jean Lafitte, if you've ever been to Louisiana, especially New Orleans, they always talk about Jean Lafitte. He was in on it. Huge, 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 an unexplored area. But back to Juneteenth, regardless, Jordan, Gordon Granger comes in, he delivers the news, right? And if you haven't seen the circular, here it is. June 19th, 1865, General Order Number 3. In fact, the uh, National Archives actually display, they have a blog post today showing you the actual written order, not the text one. They actually found it, so you can see the actual one that was written on the day that, that this order went out. And it says, there are people informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves absolute equality of personal rights and rights for property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. Think about this. Slavery has been here the entire time, even before the country was founded, right? We can say 1619, we can say even 40 plus years before that when you think about St. Augustine, Florida. And so with this general order in 1865, they literally say, okay, you guys, you're no longer owner and enslaved. You guys are gonna go from employer to hired labor. That's a big ask for all that time. The freemen are advised to remain at their present homes. Wait a minute, so you just told me that this man is now my boss, and I have to stay here with him in the exact same place that I've been living as an enslaved person. Yes, the order said that, okay? They would remain at their present homes and work for wages. So they were supposed to be paid from this point forward. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts. Remember, contrabands, just told you about that. So they said, look, we're cutting all the contrabands out. No, we're not gonna have that anymore. And that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. So this is the official order that was read out. It's a lot to digest here, a lot to digest here. Now here's the thing, within a week or so of that order being issued, another circular went out and it clarified, because clearly there was confusion in the area, right? That, you know what? Some of this isn't clear, like how, how are they supposed to stay? How are we supposed to pay them, right? And so all port, this, this next order says, all persons formerly slaves are earnestly enjoined to remain with their former masters under such contracts as may be made for the present time. Their own interest as well as that of their former masters or other parties requiring their services renders us a course such necessary. Now, if I were there, remember, we can opine about what we would have done. I would have just left. Because how do, you, how do you make a person switch how they've been treating you for the last however many years and now our relationship has changed, right? And then it goes further to, to say that permanent arrangements, right? You're gonna stay and do this until permanent arrangements are made under the auspices of the Freedmen's Bureau. If you don't know about the Freedmen's Bureau, Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands, notice that name, Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen 
and abandoned lands. The formerly enslaved were not the refugees. Those were indigent white people. So don't, when you hear that record set, don't just think it's the enslaved. There are white people that are in there too, right? The Freedmen's Bureau was set up basically to stabilize the country. We were in disarray. We, everything was crazy, right? There were, but there was a bunch of land, right? I mentioned slaveholders just leaving, right? There was a bunch of abandoned land. There were destitute people who didn't even fight the war, but had no means of making income or feeding themselves. You know, how were you going to make these relationships between the slaveholder and the formerly enslaved? Like how, who was going to be there to make sure that the enslaved weren't being mistreated, you know, or, or that the, the contracts are being adhered to? That was the whole point of the Freedmen's Bureau. They also, they, in addition to administering contracts, they settled disputes. They would marry people. They had a bunch of different functions. And the unfortunate part is that when the Freedmen's Bureau left, that's when Jim Crow rose. Because the Union troops and, and, and the U.S. Army and all of that, right, the, federal, the, the Federals were gone. So people could return to whatever devices that they wanted to. Moving down further in this same order, no persons formerly slaves will be permitted to travel on the public thoroughfares without passes or permits from employers or to congregate in buildings or camps at or adjacent to any military post or town. So how free were you really on Juneteenth, right? If you can't even, you can't even travel without, without being impeded. Yes, it's a celebration, but it's kind of like a soft celebration because you're like, we're in there, but we're not, right? And then it goes down to talk about idleness and how you need to be working. And, and some of this language is just, ooh, it's just, it's just not good. But this is where we were in 1865, right? Idleness is sure to be productive of vice and humanity dictates that employment be furnished these people while the interest of the Commonwealth imperatively demands it in order that the present crop may be secured. They were trying to make sure that people didn't lose their crops. So that's why they told you to stay where you were. So through the years, right, Juneteenth has evolved, okay? And it really is centralized around Texas. It started in Texas and it's really centralized around Texas and it just reverberated in other communities, right? You even see places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they've been celebrating Juneteenth for a number of years. And that is no coincidence because there were a number of people who were a part of the five civilized tribes who brought their enslaved people down into Texas during the Civil War, and then they went back to the Indian Territory afterwards, right? So in Houston, Reverend Jack Yates um, and Antioch, Antioch Baptist and Trinity Methodist Episcopal Churches, they formed the Colored People's Festival and Emancipation Park Association in 1872. And what this did was they took money and they bought 10 acres of land that became Emancipation Park that still exists in Houston to this day. In fact, that's where they centralized their Juneteenth festivities. And they've been held there pretty much ever since, right? And so now I would even say, and I would even argue this year, instead of Juneteenth just being national, it's international now, right? Like everyone is, is, is seeing the value of, of Juneteenth and, and, and what it means, just not just for Americans, but also for the African diaspora at large. And since we're talking about the diaspora, right, let's talk about that. In fact, I took this picture in Benin. And that image is, is an image that you'll see all over the place there. It's a, it's a jug of water that has many holes in it. And the only way to keep the water in is if we all pitch in and put our hands over the holes to keep the water in. That's, that's an image that's all over Benin. And so when you talk about freedom celebrations with regard to the diaspora, right, African people living across the world, right, a lot of their celebrations or celebrations are tied to the decolonization of those countries by European countries, right? And, and it's interesting, right? If you look at Haiti, that's the earliest year because of the Haitian Revolution, right? 
that's 1804. But if you look at other locations, which I just randomly pick them from my DNA percentages, right? Like when did they, when do they celebrate Emancipation Day or Freedom Day? Mali, 1960. Benin, 1960. Senegal, 1960. Nigeria, 1960. Cameroon, 1972. Those dates parallel another movement that was happening clear across the world. To come to the top of your mind, right? If you think about, you see your brothers and sisters in, in another country and, and you're watching what's happening with them and how they're pursuing their freedom and why can't you get that too? A lot of these dates correlate with the civil rights movement within the United States. So freedom is not only a continuum within the United States, but it's a freedom of, it's a continuum for the diaspora across the world. So to close out, I'd like to talk about one of the folks that was involved in securing that last defeat for the Confederates or against the Confederates uh, in Texas. And it's a man by the name of Commodore Givens. And I really think this story speaks a lot to not just resilience, not just making it in spite of, but how there wasn't a complacency, that there was a, a live and active want and desire and need to obtain freedom and to e just really obtain equality and equity. Going into this conversation, we've got to remember a few things, right? Our flag is three colors. And Every time you see it from now on, I hope you think about this conversation that we're gonna have right now. The United States has always operated in duality, right? And if we look at the definition of what duality is, it's the quality or condition of being dual, right? Two, right? You think of two, okay? Two sides, whatever it is, right? Dual. An instance of opposition or contrast between two concepts or two aspects of something, a dualism. If you know anything about color theory, and I'm, I guess I'm probably talking more to the design people <laughs> who might be watching this, red makes you feel warm, right? It's warmth, but blue is cool. Those are two opposite things. And when it comes to our country colors and our flag, those two complete opposites are bridged by the color white or the absence of color. We have to think about our history and how we approach it and really just our lives in the United States from this perspective. Our country was set up on this very principle, right? You can't say that all men are created equal, but there's a caveat, not all men, right? Which in some ways that might be exclusionary because that means men, maybe not women, right? We look at, we look at it from different eyes now, but we, our foundation, is in this dualness, right? Which is why we're seeing so many things happening right now with people challenging because they want, <laughs> in some ways people want us all to be warm and some people want us all to be cool. But that's not how this is set up. There's always going to be a battle or not even so much a battle. There's always going to be someone who doesn't align entirely with you or someone who falls to the other spectrum. The job of all of us is to bridge that gap and to, and to really uh, be equitable on all sides. And so think about this, right? As you have discussions, as you engage with people, our very foundation is dual. It's not one, just isn't, okay? So here is the service card for Commodore Givens. He's born about 1838. It lists his description. He's five foot ten, dark complexion, black eyes, black hair, born in Cooper, Missouri, as in Cooper County, Missouri, and his occupation is a farmer. But what I want to call out to you about this enlistment is the fact that his slaveholder is named directly on it. This is when he, this is a record of his enlistment into the U.S. Color Troops, the 62nd Regiment. And it says, claimed by Alex Gibbons of Cooper County, Missouri. And some of these instances, when you look at these enlistment cards, they will say slaveholder is from this plantation, right? And for people who are, who are a lot of them today are just wanting to know the names of their enslaved ancestors, this information is so important. It's so key to that story, right? 
And so you'll also see at the bottom, it notes that he served in the Battle of Palmetto Ranch right there. It says skirmishes on the Rio Grande near Palmetto Ranch, Texas on the 12th and 15th of May, 1865. So here, 25 year old Commodore Givens is part of ensuring that we could celebrate today just by virtue of him being in this regiment. But here's the thing you here's something you got to consider about Alex Givens. He was a slaveholder, which means that he enslaved Commodore. You're looking at the inventory for the estate of Alex Givens of Cooper County, Missouri. His most prized possession on this inventory, right? Remember how probates work. Alexander Givens died without a will which means that they had to come in and inventory all of his property for his, his wife and for his children and his descendants to receive. And among the list of things, right, you'll see heads of cows and 40 head of sheep and an iron tooth, H, whatever that is, right? You'll see people. The person on the top line is a one Negro boy named Commodore. That's how they spelled it. 28 years, $400. Now here's what's interesting. Commodore's value while enslaved, if this, if this hadn't taken place, his slaveholder passed away in 1862, towards the end of 1862. Within six months, Commodore left and enlisted in the U.S. Colored Troops. If his slaveholder had died maybe three years earlier, unfortunately, his Commodore's value before, you know, the markets would have been probably twice this. But because the Civil War was taking place and the economy was where it was, that's, that's his value. Right there in front of you. So as you see people of color, in particular Black folks, celebrating today, we are celebrating the fact that we don't have a dollar value associated with us. We're celebrating the fact that we have access to be able to find these names, right? And for me, as a researcher, I have to call out eight-year-old Henry, four-year-old Charlie, three-year-old George, one-year-old Wash, 28-year-old Amanda, and seven-year-old Mary. Because all of them together, made sure that this operation that Givens had happened. But Alex was brave enough to leave to secure not only his freedom, but the rest of the freedom for all these other enslaved people who were on this list and the other millions of other people that were also enslaved at the time. Now let's talk about the, li the, the risk that he took, right? He enlisted 10 miles from his home right? Any citizen could have apprehended him and be compensated five to ten dollars based on Missouri law at the time. When you adjusted for inflation, that's between a hundred and two hundred dollars. Now, for some people that might not be a lot of money, but you've got to remember, this might have been a lot of money for someone. So I might not own enslaved people, but I'll turn them in so that I can get sustenance for my family because our markets, everything has gone down because of the war, right? Here's the other thing, and this is directly from slave laws within the state of Missouri. One thing you got to remember about Missouri is that at one point it was Louisiana until Missouri became a state. So their slave code mirrors the one in Louisiana. Even though now we're like, well, wait a minute, Arkansas separates? You kind of got to go through Tennessee maybe in order to get to Louisiana? Nope, that was all one big area at one point. A black person was one who had one fourth part or more of Negro blood. Having three white grandparents and one black grandparent, that made you black in the state of Missouri. Now we would never, what do you mean? All these blood quantums, mm, th that was a big deal back then. So if, if you have, know someone, and I know several people that fall into this category, you would be considered black before the law, which also means that you were subject to these codes. They didn't make a delineation between free people of color and enslaved in the state of Missouri. You all fell under the same codes, right? So consider that, consider the risk that he took 
to enlist just 10 miles from his home. I know someone who went a hundred miles in the state of Louisiana and managed to go, managed to go uncaptured to enlist, right? Here's the thing. They also had slave patrols within the state of Missouri, right? And, and slave patrols, the very history of slave patrols, slave patrols are a precursor to our current policing system in the United States right now. That's how they began with slave patrols. And these were state mandated in 1845. So just think about, I, I hope your whole keynote presentation life is flashing in your head right now. Think about all of this, right? People claim that what we're seeing in terms of social uprisings have nothing to do with slavery. People claim that we shouldn't talk about slavery. People claim that, oh, this is so in the past, we need to do X, Y, Z. Well, are we really telling an accurate story? I haven't pulled any of this out of my Mohawk. This is all facts. These are all facts, okay? Patrolmen and justices of the peace, they can also beat the people that they captured. Come on, y'all. A knee to the neck didn't start with George Floyd. It didn't. So when people have, are having conversations about defunding, they're looking at it from a historical perspective. Some of it is a little crazy. I don't know. I haven't landed quite where I think about it. But we got to consider the history. It's all a part of what we're dealing with right now 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 here's the best part of the story to me right because commodore he manages to live through the civil war he made it right a number of people died because of disease a lot of folks don't know that they weren't necessarily shot they would die from scurvy and all kinds of stuff okay but what they did was his regiment along with the u.s color troop 68th infantry they had been getting education as a part of them being a part of the war effort. And they didn't want that to stop. And so when the war ended, there was a casual conversation that took place between Lieutenants Aaron Adamson and Richard B. Foster while they were awaiting discharge at Fort McIntosh, Texas. This is where they were discharged. And it's recorded as the spark which grew into an, um, an illumined fact. Foster was disturbed that the meager education provided the enlisted men of the 62nd colored infantry would have to end as the group mustered out of their service and returned to their homes in Missouri, right? Remember, they came from Missouri, enlisted in Missouri, went to Texas, fought this battle, got mustered out there, and then they had to return, right? And so he said, if our regiment will give money enough to start a school in Missouri, will you do it? And so they collected $6,000. This regiment of formerly enslaved people, the officers and them collected $6,000 and they created a school called Lincoln Institute that is now Lincoln University and it still exists in the state of Missouri. It is a historically black college. So what does that say when you give people agency and equity and you give them opportunity? They managed to live past the war collect a pension, hopefully, see their children and their lives expand and their mark is still left on the world through a university that still exists today. So when you think of Juneteenth, don't just think about the word going out from Granger. Don't just think about the people who were on the ground there who heard the word. Think about the folks in the, U the 62nd. Think about the other US colored troops. Think about the people who, those other enslaved that were on that, that inventory that I just showed you. And think about Commodore Givens. If you look at him on the 1870 census, he's marked not being able to read or write, but then 10 years later, those, ma those hash marks are gone. The war did more than just free the enslaved people. It gave them agency and it gave them access to tools and things that they may not have, have, have had, had access to. And the genealogists are on here, Simra and I saw you, you're also seeing that $150 worth of personal estate that's there as well. He got a bounty when he, did, when he discharged, which means he came back more wealthy than he went in. Another opportunity. So I just wanna give light to Commodore Givens. He died in 1891. 
Of course, I found this on Find a Grave, right? All this stuff is from, all this stuff is from Ancestry, you guys. But I want to give him some love and some light today and encourage you, especially if you um, are working maybe on the regiment project, look at the 60 second and just see what's there. And, and I noticed something pretty glaring. I noticed how many people had slaveholders listed on their, um, on their service records. And that's it for me. At this point, I got one question for you. Consider everything that I told you today. It was a lot, right? It's a lot to digest. There may be one thing that you clung on to a little bit more than another. But one thing I want you to remember is that today is about freedom, but it's not so much about celebrating that we got it. It's celebrating that we're going to maintain it. So how are you going to make sure that you are a voice for people who don't have it? How are you going to make sure that you reflect that in the work that you do? You might not even think about it. I just code, but you know what? If you code a site that I use to help people get the names of folks, you're helping. If there's an aspect of what I talked about that might influence how you design what you design or how you speak to certain things or maybe how you frame how people are referred to in your projects internally and externally, right? We have such a huge opportunity at Ancestry to really drive the conversation around not just race, not just the civil war, but around personhood and around equity in a way that no one else can do it. And no matter how large or small your role, you can grab my hand and we can walk out there to that beach at some point without a mask on and we won't have to, you know, hand sanitize and whatnot when we finish touching hands. But still, we're just dreaming right now. We've got to get millions of African-American people through this image because right now they see that there's something on the other side. They see that there's a possibility for them to get these names and to know these people, but they don't quite know how to get there. And as much as we can engineer it to get them there, I'm telling you, it'll, it'll, it'll do a whole lot. 